Welcome everyone to the Garden Nerd Tip of the Week podcast, where garden nerds from around the world talk shop, share stories, and offer their favorite tip. I'm your host, Christy Wilhelmy. My guest this week is Loria Stern, the founder of Eat Your Flowers. It's a garden-to-table catering and private chef business, and someone you may recognize from her time on Shark Tank. Her new book of the same name, Eat Your Flowers, is filled with recipes using edible flowers and inventive ways to use botanicals from the garden. Thanks so much for being here, Loria. I'm excited to talk with you. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so happy to be here. I just was telling you before we started recording that your book dropped on my doorstep yesterday uh, when William Morrow sent me a few pages from the book in PDF version. I was just stunned at how beautiful every recipe looked and I couldn't wait to talk to you. So I'm really looking forward to this conversation. My first question for you is, which came first, flowers or cooking? Well, that's a great question. And the answer definitely is flowers. Uh, I've always been a flower girl. I grew up in Ojai, California. We had a big garden growing up. We had beautiful roses, tall sunflowers are my earliest memory of a, a, a garden specific flower. So, you know, before I could even stand, I was among the flowers, I'd say. Nice. And do you have a garden right now? Yeah, I do. I have a beautiful backyard garden. I have two raised vegetable beds. And uh, when I moved into the house, the the whole backyard was, um, you know, a quick lawn that they put in and then some succulents. And my first project was tearing those out, uh, giving the succulents away, and just throwing seeds to get a natural wild bloom and see what parts of my garden are really, you know, sun loving, which ones are shade, what, what, where certain plants grow, where they won't. And I just let it be kind of a natural organic process at first, but now it's more intentional with some areas that are still really wild and, you know, just this native seeds coming in and, and happy flowers blooming. So now we're recording this in April, but this is going to air in June and we got a lot of rain this year. You're also in Southern California, correct? Yeah, I am in Mount Washington, Los Angeles. So it's uh, East LA on a mountain. <laughs> Nice. I have friends who live out that way. It does get hot, but right now you must have a lot blooming because it, of all the rain that we got, right? Oh Yeah, I am so happy about the rain. It's just, I mean, of course, there's been some issues in some parts of California, but, you know, I think in general, it's really been positive for us. And if we're talking my garden specifically, it's it's very happy. Everything is blooming or will be blooming in the next couple of weeks, so... Yeah, you mentioned you have you did some wildflower seeding of, of natives, and what do you have growing that you are some of your favorites? Well, there's a little, um, I would say, you know, I don't know if it's a hike or a park. It's it's not really well kept, but they have wild radish, um, mustards, wild uh, chrysanthemums, and what I did is I forage some of those flowers and just sprinkle them in, in my backyard. So when they dried up, they went to seed and then they sowed themselves. And that's what I have going on right now. Also from planting, uh, intentional planting, um, we also have some wild arugula, some borage, um, some little daisies, there's nasturtiums, of course. Hard to um, keep those at bay, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. And but I love them. Um, and you know, I think that it's, it's happened um, in my garden just organically. As milkweed is sprouting up everywhere, which I mean, everyone loves. I think you know. Yeah. Um, and then I have a couple sunflowers, and they're about two feet tall right now. So I'm excited for summer. Nice. That'll be beautiful. Yeah. All right, let's dive into the pages of this cookbook. It's visually just beautiful. And you start by sharing what flowers are edible and the ways that we can use them. And you you also introduce the idea of colorants, which is not, we're not talking about food coloring, are we? 
Well, we are. We are talking about food coloring and we're talking about all natural food coloring. Mm -hmm. So these, the, the colorants that I am referencing and highlighting are uh, natural colorants that I use to turn my baked goods colors to um, enhance them with health benefits as well. So for me, it's not just the color, it's also the health benefits involved. And then of course the flavor. So uh, those three things are fascinating and fun for me as a chef to always play with. And uh, especially in this world when, you know, I'm a nature girl. I don't, I don't like artificial colorants. I don't like things man-made in a, you know, sterile place where I can't pronounce the chemicals, you know, right. I really use nature. Yeah. I, I remember growing up and, and having that little, uh, box of liquid food colorings that it's like red dye 40 and all the stuff yes. <laughs> it's really gross and yeah. so you but you've got things that you're using in either powdered they're they're usually powdered right so like yeah. purple uh I remember Guy Frankel was the first person he's a sourdough bread aficionado and he used purple uh butterfly pea I'm yeah. saying it wrong, aren't I? Butterfly pea. Yeah, you're saying it right. Butterfly yeah. pea flowers. Flowers, yeah. And it's powdered. And so it turns whatever you put it in dark purple, like an indigo color. It's really beautiful. And so you're using powders mostly, right? For things like that. Yeah. And the powders are oftentimes the botanical dried and ground. So for the butterfly pea powder, for example, you know, it's just dried butterfly pea flowers ground up into powder that then, you know, turns anything color from tea to bread dough to cookie dough. Um, yeah, and, and what's also cool about that flower specifically is it reacts to acid, uh, the pH of the, the botanical reacts to acid. So when you put lemon juice or lime juice or vinegar on the butterfly blue pea infused item, whatever it is, uh, it'll turn bright pink right before your eyes. So I mentioned this in the book and I just find this kitchen alchemy so cool. Um, and it's natural, which is even more cool, you know? Yeah, it is. And I was, I was really happy to see that you showcased a purple soup early on because I've made purple soup, but it was sort of an accident, you know, with either purple sweet potatoes or purple potatoes or these black nebula carrots that just stain the cutting board every time I cut them. And I was kind of a little bit embarrassed that the color bled, but I was, you know, I was like, maybe people won't want to eat this, but here you are encouraging that to happen. Um, you mentioned that experimentation is key. So is that part of your philosophy when it comes to preparing foods with edible flowers? Yeah, I mean, I guess it was more of my philosophy, 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 <laughs> as I was, um, you know, a younger chef, just experimenting, learning about the different colorants, the the different um, saturation of each colorant, um, and also of botanicals. You know, my main bread and butter item that I sell on my website are my flour press shortbread cookies, and what I found so fascinating with, with those was how different botanicals behaved after baking. So some botanicals uh, like bachelor buttons or pomegranate petals, you know, they bake a more vibrant color than when you first put the flour on the cookie. Whereas other botanicals like, um, for instance, oregano or tarragon, or sage or lavender, purple lavender, those botanicals specifically really change color into kind of an antique looking um, shade, almost like grayish or, you know, brownish or bronzy or something, which I just found really, really fascinating. Yeah. You know, the alchemy of what is actually inside the botanical will affect the color 
that it becomes after baking. So to me, that was like one of the coolest things. And that led me down this rabbit hole of just really experimenting with so many different edible botanicals um, in my baked goods. And let me back up because I didn't even ask you about, you know, how you got to this point. You've done a lot of work as a chef or, well, you know, let's, let's talk about that. Where did it all start for you? Yeah. I mean, I've been cooking my whole life as a little girl. I would help my mom in the kitchen. You know, she was a great cook and it was always something that I loved to do. I didn't necessarily know that I wanted it to be my career until almost a decade after graduating college, when I got my first job at a vegan cafe as a hostess and veggie prep. First I started as a hostess and then I worked my way into the veggie prep kitchen. But it was then that I realized I really love working with my hands. And that was my first culinary job, which was a savory position, you know, prepping savory ingredients. And then uh, during that time, I started bringing in vegan cakes to the, the place. It was actually Hip Vegan in Ojai. The cafe is still open, but it's under a different ownership than when I worked there back in 2010. Um, so anyway, it was really cool bringing in these different cakes and my boss saying, let's sell them. So I started selling vegan cakes at at the shop and people loved them and uh, during during that same time, a fr good friend of mine asked her or asked me to make her and her husband's wedding cake. And so I watched YouTube's. I taught myself how to tear a cake, and um, that was it. I just fell in love with the process of building a wedding cake and delivering it and making everybody happy with it. It was just a really rewarding activity for me. So then I sought out jobs at different bakeries, at different cakeries. And I worked in New York kitchens for a handful of years. I worked at one bakery in particular for two years. Um, I really paid my dues. And I look back at that time as my culinary training. You know, I, I worked so hard and such long hours at such little pay, but I learned so, so much. And that led me to starting my own thing, just catering for people, um, cooking for a couple families consistently. So dropping off meals. And during the time I started posting on social media, it was, uh, you know, back in 2012 when Instagram kind of just started going. Yeah. Um, and I started posting these flour shortbread cookies that I was making. And the reason I started making those was uh, I was at the time working as a pastry chef at a fancy hotel. And I was also enrolled in an edible and medicinal plant class through a city college. It was an adult education class. So I oh. did three semesters. And that class, we just walked around um, on local hikes and our instructor would identify just all the different botanicals around us, um, all the different plants. And oftentimes they were weeds or what I knew as, as weeds. And, mm -hmm. and to my surprise, a lot of them were edible and not just edible, but medicinal. So she would let us, you know, know how they were prepared and used by the earliest inhabitants of the land. And that just really fascinated me. And that's when I decided, okay, I'm going to start combining some of these forgeable edible and medicinal ingredients with the fancy pastry techniques I was learning at work. So it was then that, you know, the idea of combining botanicals with pastry and, and food really started happening for me. And that's when my career sort of took off. Once I started posting these on social media, they made their rounds just organically and here I am now with six employees and a really booming business. So it's so impressive. And, and I have, I mean, for folks, I know this is, this is audio only, but if you can get your hands on this book, listeners, it's just beautiful. The photography is gorgeous. It's inspiring. And I know for me, I look at some of these pictures and I think, 
oh, that's definitely not going to come out that way if I make it. But you, you sort of made a point of testing these out and letting people know that it they'll they'll get pretty close if they follow the instructions anyway, right? Absolutely. And um, if 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 you all want to follow my social media and subscribe to my mailing list, I'm going to be posting a lot of different videos of me actually making the recipe start to finish. And, you know, for me, I'm a visual learner. So I like watching somebody do something rather than reading it. So maybe that would help listeners as well. But I really think the recipes are attainable, even though they may look intimidating, but with with the right processes following the instructions, yeah, they're really they're really special and delicious. So yeah, I I want to rank the these recipes on a difficulty level that's somewhere along Anne Gentry's Real Food Daily Cookbook. Not difficult, just requiring a little bit of time and some detail. Um, and so, would you say that's kind of accurate? I that's very accurate. I agree. Okay, and. I want to ask, what tips do you have for working with edible flowers and botanicals that would make things easier for people who are just kind of getting started with this idea? Well, I'm guessing that your followers and your listeners have beautiful gardens. So we, when when a follower has a beautiful garden, there's definitely going to be some uh, edible botanicals and flowers in there. So um, you're already f further along than the rest of us. <laughs> than the rest of the people out there, I'd say. But, um, you know, just following the directions, reading the recipe before you jump in, making sure that, you know, that there aren't any steps that need uh, extra time, especially with the, the bread section, you know, there's always a rise that's required generally. So I would just read through the whole recipe, make sure you have all the ingredients. And um, I note that it's, I love using a uh, kitchen, like a little kitchen um, scale. It's really important for getting accurate results rather than just measuring haphazardly. So Yeah, I noticed that you use grams and a lot of the, the measurements. It's so much more accurate. And as a bread maker, it's, I'm all grams all the time now too. So it makes so much sense. And I know you put in a few tidbits kind of toward the beginning of the book about how, you know, things people should be thinking about, like prepping stuff, you're big on prep. That was one of your things that you had said, I think. I love a good prep scene. Yes, that's very true. Just uh, prepping in advance. It's really uh, helped me out just as a business owner, you know, who I have people helping me cook. So it's good to get all the vegetables prepped in advance. Um, what I like to do when prepping if it's me myself or me with some other people is have a big bowl that's dedicated to scraps. And as you go, you know, any veggie scraps that you're not going to use, whether that's um, a potato peel or the butts of an onion, just throw it all in that um, bowl. And I have a little Vitamix uh, compost machine that composts um, overnight. But now I, I'm, you know, I think all of California, we have to put everything in the green waste bin. So it's just very easy to just throw that bowl into your green waste bin if you don't have a little composter or your own compost at home. Yeah. Now there are so many gorgeous recipes in this cookbook, but the one that made me request a hard copy of the book <laughs> was the braided yard long beans. Cause I love, I love, love, love growing yard long beans and I've served them all spiraled up in a pile or diced up, but it never occurred to me to braid them. That was genius. How did this idea come about? Well, I say a little bit about this in the, um, in the paragraph of the recipe, but one of my dear friends braided her long beans for me and she gave me the idea. Her name is Tessa Tran. She comes from a Vietnamese family and she's just a terrific terrific cook. So she gave me that inspiration. And I like to serve them as, um, as little braided lassos. I think that looks so cute. So that's where that came about. Yeah. And it's, I like that it's because it, in looking at it, I thought, how in the world do you do this? And then you really easily explain, you know, take six beans, part them in twos or partner them in twos, and then braid like you would anything else. 
it's genius and it looks so snazzy on a plate. I'm so excited to try this when mine, I have them. Well, I haven't started growing them yet, but uh, cause I'm still waiting for my peas to finish up, which purple peas, have you ever done anything with purple potted peas? Cause I, they stain my fingers when I pick them. Have you done anything with those? I love those. Well, I have a recipe for my, um, the pea tendril pressed. Um, yeah. So it's could use purple peas for that as well as the tendrils, which just are so whimsical pressed onto a dough. And that is a beautiful quiche. It's a it's a pie crust with a well. Do you use the pie crust and then the filling is the egg, the quiche filling, and then there's the the tendrils on top of it on another pie crust. Is that right? So there's a bottom pie crust. Then you put for your quiche ingredients, which include uh, peas, and then the top pie crust is pressed with um, a pea tendril. You know. I guess it's almost like an art scene. It's more just pea tendrils pressed into the dough, but the way it bakes, it's just so whimsical and beautiful. Yeah, it is so pretty. And I can't wait to try and make that. <laughs> I'm I'm gonna post my my when I do, I usually post recipes in my blog post in my blog, and then I, you know, like attribute who who it's to. Um, so hopefully people will see this or you know, and go get your book. I mean everyone's going to get your book anyway, just from the way we're describing it, but, but it is tip time. Uh, do you have a favorite tip that you'd like to share with the garden nerd audience? Uh, well, I would say people probably already know this, but plants like more water than you originally think. So make sure that you're feeding your plants, lots of water. <laughs> That's a good tip. And do you have any tips about storing the things that you collect and dry uh, so that they don't get weird or moldy or lose their color too quickly? Yeah, I mentioned some tips in the book uh, about how I preserve flowers. The main ways are drying them and pressing them. Uh, I don't want to get too detailed because I can go on forever. <laughs> but, uh, when you do dry out your flowers, you can put them in a clear mason jar and just store them in your herb cabinet. So in a dark place. Perfect. And do you use dark, dark glass for storing anything? I don't. You don't. Exactly. You're probably going through them really quickly. Yeah. We okay. through it really quickly. We do. And we also sell um, edible dried flowers on our website. Oh, fantastic. So that's where the majority of my drying go to. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much, Loria, for sharing that expert tip. And thank you for being on the Garden Nerd Tip of the Week podcast. Thank you so much. And I'm excited to see how everyone likes the book and, and everybody's um, personal, you know, ways of interpreting my recipes. I can't wait to see. Yeah, there's a lot of room for experimentation there. So yeah. where where's the best place for people to find you? On my website, eatyourflowers.com. Uh, you could also find me on Instagram at Lori A. Stern. Um, and we also are on e Instagram as Eat Your Flowers. All right, garden nerds, you'll find links to Lori's website and her social media this week on gardennerd.com. We'll also post links to where to find her book. And you better go get it because it's just downright gorgeous. That's it for this week. Subscribe to this podcast on Apple Podcast or wherever you listen. Visit us for tons of free gardening information at gardennerd.com. Consider becoming a Patreon subscriber to support all the free stuff we do here at Garden Nerd. You'll find us on Instagram and Twitter under Garden Nerd One, on Facebook as gardennerd.com, and of course, our Garden Nerd YouTube channel. Happy gardening!